All right. Shoot, who's up first? Come on. Got questions uh, that you had after watching the video, uh, or just questions that you came in with, and you wanted maybe some more clarification. Thank you, ma'am. I just want to kind of clarify. So you think somebody's doing well, but you're not entirely sure, and the person isn't really making a lot of time yeah. to talk to you. Yeah. So okay. how can I help, like, encourage them to keep staying positive and moving forward? Mm -hmm. But it's hard to talk to them more than like once every other week. So I mean, I always go back to, you know, if, if you do have communication with me, it's just a text, an email, social media. It's always nice to open up a, a, a message that's positive and you know, maybe like a little meme that has something positive on there. I mean, that can be a nice way of um, you know, continuing to promote that they're doing well and that you're proud of them. Okay. Thank you. Lauren, do you have anything? I would just say stay positive for them and, you know, encourage them to stay positive. Staying busy isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Actually, I, I try to stay as busy as I can and then go to my all my appointments with Acadia and my recovery coach. And it just helps me to just stay, stay on the course. And I know what I want. <laughs> and also I would add, you know, just offering to if they like to go to meetings or if they you know, go to a special church or something or um, you know, offering, hey, on your day off, how do we get dinner? Just offering to do something with them okay. sometimes can be really motivating and helpful too. At least, at least that person knows you're there. And let me piggyback on your question because it's a really good one. Um, <coughs> most folks don't recover in a vacuum. It's just it's very rare that somebody recovers on their own. You, you tend to recovery uh, in a community, uh, family and friends, people to support you, whether that's treatment or it's just your natural support. So, um, yeah, I, I think a lot of you are here because you may know someone that's close to you. So I think what you said, Lori, is really important. You don't want to give up on the folks. Um, uh, I, I was always struck in this, I've seen this three or four times, I'm always struck uh, by the young girl who, as soon as the doctors in the ER figured out that it was opiates, you know, there's, there's a lot of shame and blaming that ain't going on on the person. So, uh, and a lot of the folks that are in recovery have got a lot of shame and blame in their lives. So, uh, they need people that are willing to stick with them, even though horrible things have happened as they're starting to get clean and sober. So, um, you know, be that positive person to the extent you can. But yeah, I agree. Just because they're busy, that's not necessarily a bad thing because, um, um, you know, as long as it's the right kind of busy and they're involved with things that are helpful to the recovery, see if you can be part of that uh, or encourage them and be that cheerleader for them. But great question. Yeah. Who's next? You know, also being in, um, when you're first in recovery, you blame yourself for a lot of things. Like I have two uh, adult children who are addicts. And I used to say, oh my gosh, I was a druggie. Now they're druggies, blah, blah. But really, ultimately, they they chose their own path and I had to come to terms with that. And, you know, as much as I want it for them, with all my heart, it's never going to work if they don't want it. But I try not to shame them, you know, I try, I'll tell them, like, you know, I know it was hard when you were little, and I didn't, you know, like the abuse the mom was being beat up for her kids that traumatized them, and just don't shame them, be like, hey, you know, it's, it's all a learning experience. Yes, sir. How do you tell a good treatment program that they don't want to be bad? How do you tell a good treatment program from a bad one? You call your local mental health or recovery <laughs> order. Um, well, I'll tell you, you know, the reason, you know, I, I say it a little bit, talking to you tonight, um, we, we have a lot of history with providers. Um, uh, 
prior to Emma uh, taking the helm at Akeda, most of you know Dennis Dyer was there for 30 some years. Uh, and you know, Dennis has vetted a lot of these providers that they refer folks to. You know, he's talking to uh, the folks, Emma has talked to the folks, they talk to the clients that go there, say, how are you treated? How has this been helpful? So years and years, 30 some years of vetting all these providers that we send to is kind of how we've been able to determine. And there's changes, sometimes there's staff changes or management changes. Um, so we have a pretty good idea, Emma does and her staff, on which ones are legit providers, they're licensed and certified by the state, which is a big thing. Uh, do you have credentialed people? What level of credential do you have? What insurances do you or do you not take? Uh, one of the things we get sometimes, if it's a detox only uh, environment, you don't want to send anybody to a detox only environment, okay? Detox only, that doesn't do nothing. The person's detox, and, and they even address that, they're at super high risk, high risk of relapse unless they're immediately not connected into an ongoing treatment program. So it's those kinds of things. So we, we try to explain to folks when they call in how to sequence the treatment. So it's, yes, you may need these cocks, but then you immediately have to go into either outpatient or inpatient kind of residential services. So um, there's a lot to talk about. And again, I, I, Emma can talk on this too, but um, she does a pretty, her and her staff do a pretty extensive assessment with the person before they figure out what they're going to do. And that assessment takes into account all kinds of things, including motivation of the person to change and their living environment, how supportive is it to recovery. They go through all kinds of things. That assessment process, we can't skip that. Um, probably the number one call I get around this issue is a loved one saying my you know somebody that uh, you know is near and dear to me my son daughter husband wife are struggling with an addiction and they need to do this or they need to do that okay, and you might genuinely feel that they need to do that <laughs> but until Emma and her staff actually interview the person themselves and assess them they really can't make a lot of recommendations I hope you can understand why that is because again you want to admit as Lori said you know, the person has to have a degree of motivation to, to change, otherwise we might be uh, putting a lot of resources into somebody who says, you know, I don't really, I'm not ready yet. So, yeah, that, that process, that, and, and if you want to uh, expand on that, feel free, but that process of assessment and figuring out what's going on, what the person's ready for, and what they want, and what their situation looks like is critical. But to your point, Chris, yes, it's just years and years of talking with these providers, uh, examining them and making sure that uh, they're doing what they're saying they're doing, that they've got the right credentialed staff, they've got the right licensure. We can tell, uh, we think pretty, pretty well who, who's a legit provider and who's not. Dan. Yeah, you know, like prisons keep track of uh, recidivism rates. Yeah. So when you're looking at treatment facilities, how do you determine what a recidivism rate would be for a success rate? And could uh, an individual find a success rate for treatment facilities in the state of Ohio and so well, they have a 37% or a 2%. Can you right. do that? That's my knowledge. So the question is, and you, it's touched on a little bit, um, although I think it could have been um, talked about more. Is, is there a, a website that you could go to? Let's say uh, you're thinking about um, uh, helping a loved one and you want to know if I send my loved one to agency A or B or C, what's the, the chances that they're going to be successful in their recovery? I think uh, we don't have a statewide system that that's complete. You'll, you'll have certain agencies saying this is where our success rates are, uh, but we don't have a comprehensive listing of all the different uh, providers. Um, and again, because it's so unique, um, but you know, I, I think going to a place in and of itself, a residential facility in and of itself uh, would be a bad gauge anyhow because they need to go to that, if they go to an inpatient at all, they also have, most of the work is going to happen on an outpatient basis and that takes time. I don't know, Lori, how long you felt it was in your journey before you would say, you know, I'm really feeling like I would answer a survey saying, yep, this was successful, my treatment was successful. I don't know how long that took for you, but for a lot of folks it's not three months, six months, nine months. It can be a period of time before you would be able to fill anything out and say, yes, this course of treatment was successful for me. Like, when, when would you have been able to say that? At what point? Um, I think that, like, I'm going on almost four years clean, and I think it was a long time. Thank you. 
<laughs> and I'm as excited today as the day I caught it in my head. But it really it came down to I had to go to jail. I mean, I I would look in the mirror and be like, I hate myself, I hate this drug, what am I doing? But I run right back out and get high. So when I went to jail, I was there six months, they sent me to Crossway, which changed my cognitive thinking, plus Dr. Patton, I love him. He helped me to um, help realize that things that I had been through when I was a child wasn't my fault. He helped me open up. I was never willing to open up for, you know, all my life. It's just been in the last probably four years that I've, you know, now I kind of like myself and now I do like myself. And it makes such a difference. And I would say now I'm saying, yeah, this this would work. But I was a negative deli at first, you know. They drugged me and I was like, well, well, you need to do this. And I was like, oh, I don't see that working. And my counselor was like, well, you, this is how it's going to go. And I'm like, you know what? Let me think about it. I'll let you know next session. And I would sit there and I would think about what she said. And I'd go back in and I'd be like, you were right. <laughs> And it helps to have people you can connect with. I connect with my counselor, my recovery coach, and it's like it's a whole new it's a whole new world. Who would have ever seen me here or at anything that we went to participating? You know, it's like we got quite a bit. Yeah, I, I can answer that. Um, I also want to get back to your, the recidivism too. In a minute. Um, so we have currently a jail counselor down there named Dr. Patton. And so he is willing to assess anybody that is interested in um, participating in the treatment that we have down there. And so once he does the assessment, um, he has groups that he runs, he does individuals with them, um, and then as they get further along in the program, they can also be referred to one of our other counselors, um, Lori, she's a community linkage counselor. And so she does work with um, trying to help people coming from jail find housing, employment, if they're interested in medication-assisted treatment, um, and then connecting them back to ACADA. Or if they're from out of county, um, they could go to a, a different agency as well. But she helps them get connected with that um, so that when they leave the jail, they are kind of set up for their next steps. Uh, I just wanted to comment quickly on the recidivism piece. The issue I have with recidivism and successes is that whether it's jail, prison, treatment, uh, outpatient treatment, <clears throat> success is going to be sometimes in very small doses. So, for example, somebody may be in prison for a, a, a big you know, crime that that person committed, but could they still be cons considered successful if maybe the next time it was a misdemeanor instead of a felony? And, and it is a step down, and they're in jail, and it's you know, for a couple of weeks versus six months or a year in prison. Um, when somebody goes to treatment, we have treatment plans, and their goals, are they successful on them? Are they partially successful at least? And once they graduate that, um, that treatment, does that mean that they're not successful if they never use a drug again? Does it mean they're successful if they only pick up once or twice? There's just no really good um, kind of way to gauge what is true success. So it's really going to be between the person and who they're working with to kind of figure out what does the success look like now. And then maybe six months later, what does the success look like now? And it's just kind of always ongoing. Um, so that's kind of my other thought on recidivism. Toward the end of the video, we saw um, the, the claim that abstinence programs don't work for opioid addiction. You need to use the, the drug, forgive me, I can't remember the name of the drug, I remember the name sure. of the Suboxone. 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 Mm -hmm. I was rather bothered by the either or approach. Can you talk about an, the, the value of an either or approach versus a both and approach? Sure. So they, they did reference for opioids, and again, it goes back to that kind of line by the one doctor, it's like you can't magically produce dopamine uh, if, you're, if your body has stopped producing it naturally because of your opioid use. You know, the person can't just magically conjure that up within their brain. So the point is, um, 
And again, I'm just a little history, because um, Acada has done a good job over the years tracking the kinds of folks that are coming into treatment in our county. And in the late you know, 90s, nobody was coming in for opioids. Okay? And when it first started in 98, 99, we started getting one, two, three, four cases. Uh, Dennis at the time um, uh, started researching you know, the different treatment approaches, because as people were coming in, they were treating them in more of the abstinence approach, they weren't using any kind of what we call medication-assisted treatment. They were all failing, failing, failing. Uh, so that's when he started researching uh, and found out about Suboxone and now uh, Vivitrol and some other things that have uh, different medications and, or methadone uh, to assist the treatment. And it seems like with this group and when we started doing that at Acada, the sex success rate shot up. Um, so I think for some folks that there's, there's going to be a preference, a client preference that they, they do want to try to do it without medication. They do want to do an abstinence only. Uh, and I think there's some folks that want to try the medication assisted treatment. So I think you're right, uh, Emma touched on it. Um, a, a good treatment provider will always uh, listen to what the person's preference is. So it, it shouldn't be an either or. If the person says, you know what, I would really like to try this with medications to assist the treatment, or no, I'd like, uh, I'd like to try this without any medications, and I'd like to do faith based, 12 step my support network, that should be honored too. So it should be an either or um, approach. Um, but I think what we've seen locally, and I think the national trends are at least for opioid addiction, uh, the abstinence only approach, there's a lot more higher percentage of folks that fail than succeed that route. But um, uh, we, we would like to honor that if the person really wanted to try that, but probably make them aware of the stats too, just to say, you know, just full disclosure, informed consent, you know, if you want to try this, but this particular addiction, that's, it's a tough way to go, but if you really want to try that, we can. So I guess I didn't hear them say, take the drug that you need, yeah. but still get a 12-step program sure. to help you with the rest of this. Yep. And that's what I, I, I felt was missing in that presentation. Right. So a combination of the medication-assisted treatment plus 12-step or faith-based, right? And that certainly could, those could go together, and they do go together. At Akita is that we are in touch with the medication assisted doctors that we send people to. So there are weekly reports that are sent to the doctors, the doctors send reports to us so we know if the clients are no showing, we know the doctors know if they're no showing for us, if they're you know, skipping out on some of their sessions. Um, part of the, the MAT report that we send out um, kind of has like a place where the counselor can mark what is the suggested amount of meetings, counseling, group counseling, etc., um, so that the doctors and the counselors can be in touch and know what's going on with the client and be aware. And that's, that, that's a critical point, and we'll get to this question. Um, you know, it goes back to Chris's question about legitimate providers. Um, uh, Emma and Akita, they're not going to work with a doc who refuses to communicate back to them on what's going on with the, with the person that they're treating. So, because the medication is there to assist the treatment. The tough work, Lori, you heard Lori talk about it, you know, and you saw it with the ACEs questionnaire, all the trauma that's going on, you know, you know, the medication, that, that doesn't fix all the experiences you had as a child if you were abused or neglected. I mean, the, the medication doesn't do that. It's the work, it's the counseling, it's the support. So if, um, if the docs uh, Emma's working with, they're not communicating back and forth with them on how they're doing, uh, they don't work with those docs. I mean, so again, we, we, we try to self-select docs that are, um, because it's not medication-assisted treatment if the docs don't communicate back to, to the treatment professionals. It's not. And there were some rogue doctors out there that were just writing the scripts for the Suboxone that they really gave the whole medication-assisted treatment approach a bad name because they weren't doing medication-assisted. They were just pill box and they were pushing pills, and that's not medication-assisted treatment. Yeah, question. That was what I was going to say. Is Suboxone is highly addictive too, sure. and I've seen withdrawals from Suboxone yeah. worse than the heroin withdrawals. Right. So if you got a doc, she's making the point. If you got a doc that's just giving out Suboxone, which is you know uh, addicting, uh, and it's not being monitored, yeah, you're you're not helping the situation. So that's you know if we had that situation, we we would not work with a doc. And again, I would encourage folks not to work with a doc that's not linked with a treatment agency like an ACADA, and they're communicating back and forth. That's not a legit program if they're not communicating. That's My daughter's a good point. 11 months clean, and she was pregnant, and they were trying to push the box on her, like, you need to do this. She said, no, I'm not doing anything. They were trying to push it on her. Yeah. She's doing okay? It's not, yeah. She's 11 months clean. Okay. Healthy baby. 
Then that bother you with the oxy the little the babies with the oxy. Oh, that doesn't bother you. It's a good time I asked that. That bothers me. But that's a that's a real thing. Yes, sir, Mr. Stu. We're talking about the babies who are addicted. Is there a experience proven process for treating those babies that is working? And I'm not talking about just the first few days or months, but throughout other than weaning them off with the, the methadone, I don't know another approach to do it. Uh, have we found that there's any kind of lingering uh, problems as they develop? I think there yeah. probably is, like behavioral problems. They're, um, you know, they're less secure. They're, it's probably a whole emotional range that the babies don't even have a clue. That's why that in West Virginia they have so many children in, in the foster care system that no one will take because they're added responsibility. You know, it's like a special needs child. And so it probably is extensive, I would imagine. It seems like there would be an advantage of, I don't want to say tagging, but recognizing these children for potential uh, spatial programs, spatial treatment, all the way through school, probably. Yes. State of Ohio has the Help Me Grow program, uh -huh. and children that are identified as being opiate or other drug exposed are immediately referred by the hospital social worker to that program, and they continue to be mon monitored by the pediatrician and the Help Me Grow program until they're either are above minimum standards or they age out at age five, at which point in time they're referred to the public school system. That's part of already what's going on in the educational system required statewide. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Can you, can you talk about uh, intervention as far as somebody that's not addicted, but maybe the loved ones are seeing signs? And what are those signs? And what can a loved one do? Well, the signs are. <laughs> You can tell by tremendous weight loss. They're not sleeping properly. They're not eating. They're crabby, um, intense on an attitude. Um, they always feel like everybody's picking on them. Um, stop coming around. Stop coming around. <laughs> isolate. Yeah. Um, and back when I was a dope addict, I would blow off anything for that drug. I mean, it was just, it was the most important thing in my life, and I don't even know why it was, but it was, and that's why I feel so lucky that I made it out of that, but I'm not out of the woods by no means. I still have, you know, I still have to watch where I go, who I'm with, what I hear. You know, if you're an alcoholic addict, like my kids, I can't be around you. You don't want recovery, I do. And for parents, um, just like I, like I said, don't blame them. I got off topic, didn't I? <laughs> but just, something won't be right, you'll know. My parents were like so naive. They were like, we didn't know, we didn't know. I said, well, you never were on drugs. How would you? You know, they felt a tremendous amount of guilt. And like I told them, it's not your fault. I chose what I chose, no matter what I've been through. And it, it just, I don't know, it's, it's like a give and take. Just, you'll see signs. Just kind of talking about with the, the families, I think that's why prevention is so, so important in the schools because if we can start talking to the kids young about these addictive substances and at an age appropriate level, of course, but how these kinds of um, substances can harm the families, harm lives how to choose better friends, how to be able to stand up to peer pressure, and trying to teach them from a young age, then they are more likely to come to you if there is a problem that they're concerned about. And I know, you know, just for myself, I have my little 10-year-old back here who is playing on her phone, but I, I talk with her all the time about, you know, the importance of um, what, you know, drinking too much alcohol can do or, or things like that. And, I just hope that, you know, if something comes down to where she's in that position, that she'll be able to talk about it with me. 
I think as a, a parent or <coughs> somebody who's very close to someone, you just you can feel when there's something not right. You may not know it's drugs, you may not know it's alcohol, but you know there's something not right. Yeah. The um, uh, you know, also I think everyone received a flyer for part two of this, okay? Uh, and that is um, all about the question. Um, there you go. The question that was asked about how uh, might family and friends intervene with a loved one who they suspect might be struggling with opioids or any uh, addiction. So uh, the plan for that will be over at the library. The plan for that is to kind of do some role play situation on um, uh, some situations that maybe you've experienced or you think you might um, want to interact with a son or daughter, wife, boyfriend, etc. We're gonna we're gonna try to do our best to walk through a series of those with you all if you come to that. Um, we I think um, uh, towards the end, Larry or John are gonna talk about uh, right now. Uh, if you've got a specific scenario you want us to cover in that part uh, two, we'll do that. Um, it's kind of individualized, so it, it's it's tough to give a a pat answer on how to intervene. You, you want to educate yourself to the gentleman's point uh, upstairs. You want to have the right information so you don't say to them, what's wrong with you? Produce to vote with me. You know, get, get motivated. Stop doing it. I mean, if, if you don't know better, you might say some things just because you're not informed. You didn't know the information was in that video. So we, we encourage family and friends to get informed on this particular addiction so you can be in a better position to help. But then how do you do it? So, uh, so offering to go with the person to their intake appointment, it's scary. You know, uh, offering to go with them whenever you can to be a support to them, not giving up on them, not enabling them, but supporting them. And we're going to cover that, you know, if you come from part two, because that's, that's a significant and important distinction. Is this enabling or am I supporting, right, Ori? Yeah, you almost have to take the tough love approach as far as, you know, I need money, you know, you know, for what I mean, would need a job, you know, and not, not. Not enable them, you know. I found myself to be an enabler, and you know, and not even trying. But so I had to put my son out because I was enabling him to drink and do what he wanted with his money while I'm sitting here in recovery. And it just yeah, it wasn't good. So and Al-Anon, Al-Anon helps to um, bring issues up and try to teach you how you can see the signs and cope with it. No. Mm -hmm. yes, we need to uh, talk to our kids. We need to learn about addiction and then talk to our children about how to treat children of addicts. Because my grandkids go to school here. I have six, I'm raising And they come home in tears. Other kids? Some things that kids have said. Okay, so. Where do you think they heard that? Right. You know? So we've. So we I, talk to our kids about how they treat. Kids of okay. Right. Wendy, you hear that? Um, we got one of our prevention specialists in the room, uh, and again, um, Superintendent Booster is still here. Now there she is. Correct. She's been a huge support down the Loudonville area for prevention in the school system. You know, but this is an interesting um, topic. I don't know if we cover in our prevention. She's she's saying. How can other young people be supportive of other young people that maybe have been exposed? You know, the parents maybe they were removed because of addiction, so they can say hurtful things or maybe helpful things. But yeah, that's an interesting angle. So how can as a young I'm a you know young person support another young person who maybe had a really tough time because of addiction? So versus uh, you know saying some really harmful. I think that's an interesting angle. That's important. You know? Right. Why are you with right. You know? Why are you live with grandma? Yeah, you mom? know, yeah. yeah. Your mom should have feeling like oh, how do you answer those questions? Oh, if you're a young person and you've just been removed from your parents' house, you've got all these feelings. How do you explain that to other kids? You know, you know that's that can be really yeah. difficult. Appreciate your support, Superintendent, for start down here in these schools. We're, we're doing a lot of um, alcohol, tobacco, other drug prevention. We need to do, continue to do that in all our districts, and, and we're trying to work with our partners in, in the schools to increase that, and I think our governor supports that. So uh, I think uh, you'll see more and more of those kinds of things, but that's a unique one. I'm glad you said that. program at the high school now that my 14-year-old granddaughter is in, the drug-free program, where you can Great. Yeah. She's in that. Drug-free Clubs of America is one of the programs down here. Yep, yep. Yes. 
So I noticed in the video that we watched, <coughs> pardon me, that um, I think it was Ativan or Adderall was considered one of the addictive drugs in the video. And I happen to know somebody that has a child on one. What do doctors do to ensure that those children get the proper dosage and not take a turn for the worst? That's a, I can get myself in a lot of trouble answering that question. So, <laughs> so the, the, <laughs> no, that's a, that's a tough question because um, everybody is biochemically different. And so what may be a good dose for that eight-year-old boy may not be the right dose for that eight-year-old boy. Um, that is tough. Typically, I think pediatricians do their best to start low and then kind of, um, maybe increase that dose as needed for, you know, symptoms that are persistent. Um, but I, I think they try to start low and, and, and work the way up. But the amphetamines are, are, are I think, um, abused more. Um, I mean, you see amphetamines abused in college for sure, um, high school level for sure. Um, kids sell them, share them. Um, so, you know, they, they are a potential source of abuse for sure. And is there a safer alternative that these pediatrics could use? No medication, yeah. Well, yeah, that absolutely. Would be, yeah. That would be the same. <laughs> there, there is one that I'm aware of, Stratera, I believe is what it's called. I am not sure if it's okay for children, though, to use, but I know that um, when I worked at an inpatient treatment center, our psychiatrist would not prescribe anything that had amphetamine. And if somebody had um, a diagnosis that needed that kind of medication, Stratera was what she would use, and there's no amphetamine in it, but I'm not sure if it's safe for children or not. So. One, one of the, you know, I'll, I'll stop myself, my boss is here, but I don't want to get in too much trouble, but um, ask your pediatrician, you know, if the FDA has approved this particular uh, drug for children, and it's the vast majority of the medications being prescribed for mental health issues to young people were never approved for children. So we've got four or five, six, seven year olds taking antipsychotic medications. You know, we've got we've got an issue. So yeah, that we're talking about Adderall, which is an amphetamine. Okay. Um, so just yeah, there are alternatives, non-drug approaches. Uh, we've got uh, Apple C. Jerry's here. We've got uh, they actually have a clinic, an ADHD clinic, which is. Uh, all about alternatives so there, there are out there but uh, that's a that's a quick way for anybody to, to quiz your, your pediatrician now remind me doc was this one approved this particular drug approved for young kids or just adults Let's see what they say okay. on this one. all right thank you uh, all right we're getting close to nine but a couple more questions i know we can take and then larry you know john has some closing remark yes sir uh oh, touching on <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> Touching on the insight in Canada and where it might be legal in a lot of places in the U.S., yeah. other than funding, what type of roadblocks do you guys come across that prevent treatment that you'd like to see? Oh, roadblocks to treatment. <laughs> well, if any. Oh, the harm reduction strategies. Um, yeah. Are you talking about the needle things? I'm just asking, like, as counselors and prevention, have you come across laws or institutions or senators or programs or doctors where it's just like, if that wasn't there, it would be much easier for us to treat people? I think there's always going to be politics when it comes to drug and alcohol um, addiction and treatment, mental health treatment. I can't say specifically if you know this particular person or something was removed that everything would be fine, but I think politics is probably going to be a huge issue in any county, in any state. It just is. It's just a sensitive subject. Yeah, I, I can't think of anything glaring. I mean, th there are some advantages in the research for these. Uh, needle exchange programs, these harm reduction strategies, but I, I'm not necessarily sure that that's not necessarily would make such a great impact here locally. It could have some impact, I mean, but our rates of uh, HIV uh, and some of the other uh, diseases uh, through needle are, are fairly low. Um, our overdose rates uh, are amongst the lowest of the 88 counties, 
And actually, so, so we have a lot of good news. So I can't think of anything major that's getting in the way of ACADA or some of the other professionals. I mean, I think probably the, the little hiccup is for those that do need inpatient care, residential care, that's still a very costly level of care. Um, and we, we don't send a whole lot of folks into that level of care just because of resources. So if there was a way to make that particular level of care a little bit more um, uh, cost effective or insurance covered, that may be a little bit different. And that might help some folks. But um, you might recall the family, the military family, they spent you know lots and lots of money. Uh, and I have personally talked with, maybe, I don't know if anybody in this audience, uh, parents or grandparents that have blown their entire savings their retirement because they went from residential to residential to residential, didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, and now they're out of money. So when folks need that level of care, um, it, hopefully if it was more affordable, I think that's one thing I can think of. Having towns up across those two major highways, 30 and 71, prosecutors now, so things are better here uh, than in some of those. No, there was just that big bust over there. Uh, I'm sure that will probably be beneficial to us. Our numbers tend to be lower. Um, in fact, we, we've been talking about it at our opiate uh, meeting for a while. Our opioids, uh, and folks coming into treatment, folks getting in trouble on the law enforcement side, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, has been going down. Our meth has been really good. It's been spiking here lately. Yeah. So methamphetamine yeah. Um, and I think you saw that even if you read the, 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 the paper about that bus, there was quite a bit of methamphetamine involved in that bus as well. And I'm not saying that, that we're, we're through the opioid issue, but uh, it seems like uh, that trend is coming down in terms of the, the folks that are either overdosing, coming into treatment, getting into trouble with law enforcement, uh, uh, seems to be on the decline. Uh, but you're right, we, we're close to um, Mansfield and uh, you know, like there, there tends to be a lot of bad things happening over there sometimes, but I appreciate the efforts locally. Uh, uh, that big bust, I'm sure that's going to have an effect. I don't know if there's any other thoughts about uh, numbers. We didn't get into a ton of numbers, but I would say for the most part, whether we're talking overdose rates um, or otherwise, we tend to be in the lower end. In fact, we, we kind of joke about it. We, were not a, we weren't even eligible to get some funding because our, our rates of overdose were so low. Eligible to get state with funding for some of the sources. So that's good, but just still thought we should get some funds. A couple more questions and then we'll turn it over to John and Larry. Well, it kind of looks like maybe we're near the end here. We do have one more small segment, but uh, maybe we can uh, give a round of applause for two reasons. One is for, for the low. Um, rates of some of these things compared to other counties, and then also for our uh, panelists tonight, okay? Can you give a round of applause? 